Drugs, Crime, and Politics, brought to you by the Drug Policy Forum of Texas. Good evening. I'm your host, Buford Terrell. With me tonight, my colleague, Clayton Jones. Good evening. Good evening Clayton. Uh, I understand this time there are some issues that have been bothering you recently that I need to talk about. Oh, there's so many things that bother me recently, um, especially just like Montana. Yeah. They've closed the uh, growing facilities that the state has set up for the nonprofit organizations okay. of manufacturing their own uh, manu marijuana instead of buying it from small collectives. And the state, the feds, shut them down. Okay. And now nobody's gone to jail. Nobody's being prosecuted. But they come in and they just tear everything up. And, you know, maybe like you said, I've read too much into the Ogden memo. Okay, when the assistant attorney general said that they would leave alone patients who were following state law. What you're forgetting and what the people in Montana and California and Colorado, all three are forgetting, is that when a lawyer makes a promise to you, you've got to check each individual word carefully. Mm -hmm. And if you look back to the original Holder Statement and the Ogden Memo, what they said was, that they would not waste federal resources prosecuting patients suffering from disease using marijuana to alleviate it. Are those others following state law? The problem is, if you look at the state laws in California and Montana particularly, they have no provision in those statutes for anything other than individual growing or small self-grown cooperatives. Anytime you have a tiered distribution system with money changing hands for plants or plant parts, then those may be a logical extension of the law, but they're not covered by the law. And to the feds, they look like just any other for-profit, commercial, illegal drug dealer. And the problem is, if you read the Ogden Memo carefully, as long as they're not arresting patients or taking their plants away from them, are defined caregivers under the state statute as carefully defined under the statute. They're not breaking what they promised to do in the Ogden Memo. Okay. The problem is the state laws don't set out state law protection for the rest of the distribution chain. Okay, but then again, we've got um, a governor of um, Arizona, yeah. who's come out and said to all the policemen at the uh, police chief's uh, convention there in the state that they were wrong by not stepping up and speaking out about it. Mm -hmm. And she said, I did as soon as we realized it was gaining um, momentum. Yeah. And now we're in uh, a situation that this law is making it dangerous for our citizens. Well. So she is she, out she, to try to... to some extent, Christie in New Jersey are saying the same thing and they are half right. And, for instance, if we look at some of the California situations where sheriffs have set up schemes where they hand out uh, plastic ties to go on to registered marijuana plants. Those sheriffs, by doing that far and providing some of them even hold seminars for growers, they are probably stepping over the line and engaging in a conspiracy to violate the federal drug laws. 
those sheriffs and their employees could be brought to trial in federal court and could go to jail. If, on the other hand, we merely have someone in a California office who takes a letter from a doctor's office that says, I have suggested to John Doe that marijuana might help his gallbladder or whatever, mm -hmm. and fills out an ID card based on that, and there's a name in a register, that's probably not assisting in are abetting the commission of a crime, are conspiring to commit a crime, and those state employees are safe. The, the problem is if the state law requires a state employee to do anything that amounts to taking an active hand in running a distribution method or protecting a distribution method, that that's quite possibly an unconstitutional law and it definitely exposes state agents to jeopardy. And the governor's right in saying she shouldn't be telling state employees to do that. The problem is no one has ever sat down and carefully drafted a state statute that provides for large-scale, professional quality, multi-stage distribution chains that does not require active participation on the part of the state. If some state would do that, uh, then it's quite possible that the, the Department of Justice guidelines would be completely hands-off. But frankly, most of the state laws are pretty amateurishly drafted. And <clears throat> if you look, for instance, at California when it started out, the assumption was you'd have self-growers, you'd have small collectives that mm -hmm. more or less were member-organized and run. And, uh, no one visualized the kind of full-scale, uh, vertically organized distribution schemes that have grown up since then, and the laws really don't take them into account. Okay. Now, I just seen on television the other night, Mendocino County, their sheriff up there, they have a sheriff that's doing this marijuana stuff, and he's doing in site inspections. Mm -hmm. They're charging for the site inspections, and they're certifying that this is legal cannabis. He is probably, he is probably one foot over the line and running the risk of a hard-nosed U.S. attorney indicting him. And I'm not sure, and, and I'm not an expert on California law, so mm -hmm. don't take this as authoritative. But I'm not sure that under the California statutes, as I am familiar with them, would consider those to be legal grow operations, simply because they are for profit, they are at least two or three steps removed mm -hmm. from the end user. Yes. They're not uh, in any way controlled by the caregivers as defined by the statute. So uh, their legality hangs by a stretch of a rather tenuous thread at best. Okay. Now we have Michigan, who is okay. trying to change the law. Okay. Montana wants to change their law. Arizona wants to change their law. And these are all voter referendum laws. Yeah. And <laughs> they're just trying to go back and undo what w the people have said we want. Well, and if you look in the city of Houston, we've got a mess right now because we had uh, the city council agree to put red light cameras in. We had what everyone thought was a referendum to pull them down. 
We then had a federal judge say the referendum was no good because it was outside of the time allowed for, for these things. Uh, each state has different referendum laws. There's no way that you can say how referenda work. At least one or two of them that I have heard of have provisions in their state constitutions that the legislature can overrule or reverse referenda by statutes. Others like California, the referendum in effect has the same effect as a constitution an amendment to the state constitution and the legislature can pass statutes to carry it out or enable it but the only way to set it aside is to go back to another referendum or constitutional amendment and the other states that have referendum laws it's every possible combination in between oh well it seems like Michigan, Michigan is a funny situation in that the state seems to be reasonably content with the medical marijuana law. What has happened there is that local governments, cities and townships and counties are revolting and some of them now are claiming that under their city charter, the city government is required to uphold all local, state, and federal laws. Now, uh, generally speaking, the federal government cannot compel a state or local entity to enforce federal laws. They can, in, they can require every individual in a state to obey the federal law and they can stop the state from doing anything on its own that hampers or tries to set aside or negate the federal law. But if you're wearing, say, a Houston police uniform, that doesn't make you a member of the FBI and your job, and usually the oath that, that they swear, is to carry out the obligations of the ordinances of the city of Houston and the laws of the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. If you want to enforce the federal laws, pick up the phone and call the FBI. Thank you. That's why they're there. And, and a lot of places, uh, a lot of police forces, I know a lot of California police chiefs and police officers and sheriffs have come out and said, but it's against the federal law and I'm going to enforce the federal law. I suspect that if he reads the fine print in his oath of office, that's not his job. job. And part of it, we need to do more to, to educate local police forces. So what you're basically saying is, is we're in that protracted period that there's going to be a lot of stinging going on in different places. Yeah, and, and part of it is, and this is the nasty, dirty little secret that U.S. attorneys don't want to admit. Right now, if we look at most of the surveys that have been done, around 80% of the adult population in the country are in favor of medical marijuana. And if 80% are in favor of it, that means that more than 80% of it have heard about it. Mm -hmm. Which means that no matter how many questions they ask on voir dire, no matter how thoroughly they try to screen the jury panel, U.S. attorneys are not going to be able to get jury jurors for federal trials that are innocent on the issue of medical marijuana. And even though the rules of evidence can keep any mention of medical marijuana out of the trial and away from the juries, someone on that jury panel is going to know enough to figure it out and say something and I would really be surprised 
unless you really have an outrageous example of a guy that's made $17 zillion selling supposedly medical marijuana to the general market in California and was arrested in his Lamborghini with six gold chains around his neck. Anything short of that, I doubt if the U.S. attorney is going to be able to get a convic jury conviction in most of the medical marijuana states. Okay. The juries just aren't going to buy it. Well, Ed Rosenthal, they bought it on him, and he was doing uh, the city's bidding, yeah, growing those... Yeah, uh, that was years and years ago. And if you go back and you read the story of Ed's trial, <coughs> they went to unbelievable lengths to make sure the jury never heard the word medical, never heard any connection between Ed and medical marijuana, heard nothing about his, his agreement with the city of Oakland. The, the record was kept very, very, very clear of everything except for the fact that he was growing marijuana. And if you'll remember that even in that trial, even with the jury finding guilty, the judge sentenced Ed to one day. Mm-hmm. Most day time served. Yeah. So, and, and that's why when you hear about raids now today in California and, Monta and Montana mainly, you never hear of anyone being indicted no. or charged with anything. No one's brought to trial. You just have establishment trashed during the raid, computers confiscated, plants torn up and burned. Their attempts to enforce the law by terror rather than enforce it by law. It seems to me when they do that, it just reminds me so much of Europe in the 1930s. <laughs> I think that uh, there was a it reminds me more than that, I would say, it's more <clears throat> like the United States in the 19 teens and 20s, going into saloons with axes and baseball bats. Mm -hmm. Then people wouldn't get convicted. Uh, mothers wouldn't uh, convict people for drinking. Yeah. They had a hard time with the uh, well, court system. Mothers, mothers wouldn't have been the issue there because there weren't any women on the jury. but. Nobody was brought to trial in most of those raids. Hmm. <coughs> and, but the, the government should figure out that you can't enforce a law that nobody wants. And with 80% of the population in favor of medical marijuana, at, at least on that issue, we have a law that nobody wants. Okay. Hello, caller, you're on the air. Yeah, I'd like to ask you a question about okay. when the police make drug busts and they seize all the cash and the money, do they really turn the money in or where does the money end up? Okay. That's a good question. <clears throat> and it depends on who's on the raid and who's watching. Some of the money gets turned in. But if you go back and look at studies and reports of police corruption, going back to our most fundamental basic study, the Wickersham Commission Report of 1930, a lot of that money never gets turned in. And one of the interesting cases is even when the police are on the up and up and honest is what happens to the money. We've got a strange case going on in Houston right now when the police made a routine traffic stop, brought in a drug, drug to search. They found over a half million dollars in cash in the car, hidden in a TV set and a propane tank. And uh, no indication that I have heard or that has been released yet 
connecting that money to drugs or drug transactions or to anything illegal. And let's face it, if you've got a half million dollars in cash and you just want to carry it around with you in your car, there's no law that keeps you from doing that. You can stash it under your mattress at home if you're foolish enough to do so. Now, there are laws saying that if you deposit more than 100000 at a time into a bank, they have to report it to IRS. There's limits to how much you can take out of or bring into the country in cash. But if you want to have a lot of cash and carry it around, you can. However, if you've got a half a million dollars, you're probably going to get arrested and run a big chance of the money being confiscated as drug money. The problem here is under the federal law, if the federal government has probable cause to think that any property, and this is usually money, but it can be even a house in some cases, if any property is either the fruits of a crime are an instrument used to commit a crime, if they have probable cause to believe this, then they can forfeit that property to the government and it's up to the owner of it to file suit within a very limited period of time and prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it's his property and that it was not used as fruits of a crime. This is a blatantly unfair law. What's even worse is that money goes not to the government, but to the police agency making the forfeiture. So that, for instance, I know of at least one sheriff department uh, in this end of Texas that uses part of its drug money to hold beer and barbecue joints on the sheriff's ranch for all of the members of the sheriff's department. Uh, it's used to pay snitches uh, for undercover drug work. The most fictional, the fictional example that most people think about it uh, if you remember the old Miami Vice TV show where Don Johnson as an undercover cop drove around in a Ferrari, according to the storyline, that was purchased by forfeited funds or was a forfeited car itself. So there's a lot of this going on. Texas is the number one state for forfeitures. Texas, most of its forfeitures uh, go through the Department of Justice rather than channeling it through the state because if they channel it through the state to take it, it goes towards education. That's right. And if they go through the Department of Justice, it comes back to the police department. So we're and getting back. With no, with no supervision. Uh, if you're going to keep forfeited money, I think the law should be changed so that even if it goes back to the police agency, they should be able to spend it only with the authorization of whatever their budging authority is. So that if the Houston Police Department wants to spend money to buy a Ferrari for an undercover cop, to use the Don Johnson example, they would have to go to the city council, ask for the city council's approval, and only if the city council voted yes could they then spend that money in that way. So uh, I, th I think the idea was by taking the profit away from kingpins, uh, you take the reason away from being in the drug business. It doesn't work that way. It just corrupts law enforcement. Uh, we need to take a break. We'll be back shortly. <laughs> Drug-free America and zero tolerance really doesn't make much sense, does it? So it does make sense, however, to find ways to reduce the harms associated with drugs. And that's what I want to talk 
I'm going to start thinking about whether it is really laws that make the difference or whether people use drugs or not. Al, Al Capone didn't shoot people because he was intoxicated. Right, exactly. Those people are not fighting over drugs, they're fighting over money. Drug laws have no basis in science. Drug laws are based on politics and money. So there's this unholy symbiosis between, on the one hand, those who are selling illegal drugs, the uh, drug lords, if you will, and on the other side, the drug warriors. War on drugs uh, isn't working, and that uh, if anything, it's just making what we call the drug problem a lot worse. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Buford Terrell, Clayton Jones is with me. Uh, the book I'm going to recommend tonight uh, pretty well sends you back to school. It's Drugs and Drug Policy, What Everyone Needs to Know by three professors of public policy at different schools. Mark Kleiman, Jonathan Calkins, Angela Hawking. Uh, this is pretty much an introductory level book. Uh, I would say that it's quite readable by most high school students. It does a very good job of bringing up most of the issues of drug policy, including drug testing, prohibition, decriminalization, a little bit of the difference between the different kinds of drugs, uh, teen drug use, uh, law enforcement corruption. The problem is it answers them at a high school level, too. It's very, very summary, very much on the surface. Uh, there's an old saying that in most things, the devil is in the details. Well, if the devil is in the details, this is one of the most saintly books I've read in a long time. So you're not going to find a lot of answers in here but it's a great introduction to find out what the questions are, to find out what's meant by all of this argument about drug policy. And at the end of the book, they come out with their own list of three different lists of things to be done. One they call the consensus list, which is things that they think that almost everyone agrees on. Uh, the second list, which they call the pragmatist list, which are things that work, and one that they call the political bridge too far. And frankly, their list of political bridge too far is barely getting close to what I think are some of the bare minimums needed for drug reform. But this is a great way to get your feet wet 
in what most of the major issues of drug policy are. But don't look for it for answers. It will get you a lot of the basic questions. We got a caller. Okay. Hello, caller. Are you there? Yeah, this is Dean calling in. Hey, Clay, how are you? Very good, Dean. How are you? I'm good. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think uh, it, it's important to realize we're, we're winning the drug war. Our side is winning uh, because the other side is totally out of ammunition and throwing rocks and words at us these days. They don't have any ammunition. Yeah. I think that's true. Uh, you've, you've heard me mention Malcolm Gladwell many times. And his big book, The Tipping Point, is that a lot of things look like they happen overnight. But it's because pressure just keeps building and building and building and building until finally that key domino topples over. And I really think we're approaching the tipping point on this. Well, I, I do too. I mean, you, you keep seeing the stories on the, on the television, you know, the Chronicle, they're talking about they built a whole bunch of new soccer fields down in Ciudad Juarez, yeah. thinking that would help the children to, uh, you know, steer clear of the, the drug gangs. Yeah. Yet now the drug gangs control those parks yeah. and, and uh, shoot the kids who, uh, you know, try to enter the territory of, uh, you know, another cartel. Yeah. Um, th there's just no logic left to it. <laughs> so few people left uh, trying to proclaim there is logic. Yeah. And the uh, sad thing is they have the uh, official, quote, capacity yeah. to say these things time after time without, as I said, any ammunition, no reason, no basis for what they're saying. You know, and, and let me ask you about this, Dean, because you hear more of this than I do. But it struck me that for the last several years, I have not really heard anyone in Congress coming out as a big drug warrior saying things like, we've got to get tough on drugs, we've got to do more to stop the drugs. That old drumbeat of the drug warrior just seems to have disappeared on Capitol Hill. Well, you know, you're right, uh, Buford. I mean, there's still those like uh, Rick Santorum that when they get the chance to put it into a conversation. Well, he's a has-been, though. He's, he's not in Congress anymore. Is, well, then I stand corrected. Yeah. All right, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the, 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 I guess the, the point is the, there, there is so few left. And, and uh, the, the sad thing is they do have the, mm, the ear of the media. They are given, quote, credence. Uh, you know, the, if, if you'll notice, when they have these discussions, uh, say, on uh, in, any major broadcaster, yeah that the drug czar, or whoever represents the drug war, is in a different room, probably a different city from the, the uh, other person. And will never, never, never take open questions. No, they cannot. Uh, well, yesterday, the day before, President Obama was asked what he thought of uh, legalizing marijuana, and he started rambling a bit, and he says, well, I guess I'll just leave it there, because he didn't have anything to underscore define what his quote belief and uh, the the opportunity will come whether it's you clay me somebody will have the opportunity uh hopefully on a national basis to uh demand an answer to a, a couple of very important questions and they will not have any justification for what they've done well, I, I think it would be very easy to break the drug war but it'd be very difficult to get people to do it and that's when people get arrested that uh, for simple drug possession, marijuana, ask for a trial by jury, they're going to go to jail. Yeah. And, you know, if one out of every ten people would do that, I think we could make a big difference in this state, and it wouldn't take long for the state to say, hey, wait a minute, our, our courts are getting clogged up. We can't do this. There was a uh, state senator up in Oklahoma that spoke just today on behalf of a gentleman who's been in prison now, I think, 25 years. Yeah, on a life without parole for possession of marijuana for therapeutic use. Right, and uh, today the parole board recommended that he be pardoned. Yeah. Uh, that was thanks to that senator from uh, Oklahoma, uh, the Oklahoma state senator, yeah. who testified before the parole board who helped with this gentleman. Uh, the governor last time around, it was a different governor, uh, turned down the, the uh, 
recommendation of the parole board. Yeah. But let's see if that happens again. I have hopes to interview that senator. I'm sorry, I don't have his name in front of me uh, for my show coming up this weekend. And it brings to mind, last week I interviewed a gentleman, Mario Canseco. He's vice president of Angus Reid Polling Organization. Yes. They, they ran a poll. 55% of Americans now want uh, legal marijuana. And they said that I think it was 65, 70% of Americans uh, find the drug war to be uh, a failure. Uh, but then the way they worded the questions in the other side, they said, are you for legalizing cocaine? Are you for legalizing heroin? Yeah. And there was only 7 or 9% of the people were in favor of that. Now, I think it is the verbiage, the wording of these questions that lead people to uh, choose you know, not to embrace the idea of legalizing. Because uh, I, I talked to Mr. Uh, Canseco about it. I said, what if you change that question to say, would you be in favor of regulating drugs for adults if we could destroy the cartels, eliminate the reasons for the gangs? And uh, I think we would get a totally different response in that regard. What do you think? Well, I think Great. you're right, but I want to bring up two other issues, Dean. And you're maybe the man on the spot for the. Uh, and this is one idea I got out of this little book by Kleinman and the others. Do you know of any newspaper or major television outlet, broadcast or cable, that has a dedicated full-time drug reporter? I am, I am not. Except a, for you and me. A, a permanent <laughs> one, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, what's his name, John Stossel did a few, you know, reports in that regard back when he was with ABC and since, I think. Yeah. But, but he was not full-time. Yeah. Well, the, the reason, and, and they brought it up, is because that if you read any drug story in any newspaper in the country or see anything on television about it, what you hear are the same tired old myths Yep. that everybody knows or that came out of last week's or last year's or last decade's DEA or ONDCP press release. Well, sure. That there needs to be somebody in the media who takes enough time to study up and be as fluent in drug law and drug culture as most big papers have someone who is fluent in stock market news, or the law in Af war in Afghanistan. Well, you know, there, there are a couple of gentlemen working at the Houston Chronicle, uh, Dane Schiller and Dudley Aldous. They're doing a little better. They really are. They are. They, they, they focus a lot on the drug war, on violence, crime, and gangs, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and just last week, I sent a, uh, a request to the features editor at the Chronicle that they give me, I, I suggested, a twice-weekly column yeah. dealing with the subject of drugs and that I would get the expert, uh, you know, advice and yeah. information from doctors and scientists and so forth to, to provide the real story. Because what we've been talking about or what we've been observing over the last uh, these long time uh, is that they give two sides to the story. They don't necessarily give the truth. No. And they're, they're giving two sides to a story that only deserves... The, only one side really deserves well, respect. Well, even if you're going to give both sides, though, for one of the sides, rather than researching it like they would a real story, they simply repeat what some DEA agent told them. Yeah, yeah. latest pronouncement from yeah. the ONDCP. Yeah, yeah they, they, they never research that side of the issue. They just take the handout. Well, that's... That's been the problem for decades. It was uh, Richard Cowan, a famous activist. He's now living here in Texas. He said the uh, main reason for the problems of the drug war, bad journalism. Yeah. And I, I think that uh, underscores it and hits it right in the head. Well, and the other, the other problem, and it's one also I think that you're in a position to chip away at. And this is at least going back to 1986, if not earlier is the, the folk wisdom on Capitol Hill and in the state legislatures that drug law reform is a third rail that no politician dares touch. 
that that just saying you're want to weaken the drug law will end the career of any politician. And th that was true, I think, uh, in 86, perhaps. But I, I think it's far from true now. I think uh, there are many uh, races, uh, the yeah. political races around the country, where uh, the competitors for that, that job are outdoing one another and talking about improving and working on change and making a difference. Yeah, but uh, how, how many politicians know it, that it's not true anymore? I, th I honestly think the majority. I think the majority of Americans know, yeah. probably even that poll from uh, Angus Reid says yeah. as much. People know this drug war is a failure. They're, they're just afraid of uh, what might replace it. But, uh, well, thanks to the, the good folks like y'all and, and the shows I do, we are educating people to those uh, potential changes, what might uh, better serve our nation and, heck, the whole world. Yeah. Well, who have you got coming up this weekend? Well, let's see. Uh, I have a gentleman. Um, i got his book right here. He's written How to Change Your Drinking. A Harm Reduction Guide to Alcohol is written by Kenneth Anderson. I'll be uh, speaking with him on the um, Century of Lies show. And then it does. Uh, pre preceding that, I'll be speaking with Heather Fry. She's the daughter of Molly Fry, who was uh, sentenced to prison just uh, not two months ago <coughs> for uh, growing marijuana. And uh, her husband was a doctor. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't think of his name right now, uh, who uh, was uh, the doctor, person, you know, recommending the marijuana to the people. They were from a little town in California. They uh, actually worked with their local sheriff, showed him the plants, told them they were following 215. Here's how we're, you know, following the procedures. Yeah. Apparently, uh, some cop in that, uh, that um, police department informed uh, the feds, and the feds busted them. Yeah. Or over a period of time, growing more than a hundred plants. Yeah. You know, it's uh, they can aggregate, right, and compound anything. And under the federal law with marijuana, a hundred plants is the magical number that turns it into but, a really, 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 really serious felony instead of just a felony. Right. Yeah. But. Uh, uh, those shows air uh, locally on KPFT and KPFT Houston, I mean uh, Galveston and KPFT Huntsville. Here in Houston, it's 90.1 FM. That's Sunday night at uh, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. You can listen live at kpft.org, or you can uh, check it out uh, by Monday on my website, which is drugtruth.net. Uh, yeah, we're on the cusp of something. The wind's blowing, I think, in the right direction. Um, okay. We need the listeners out there to do their part. Write that 50-word letter, send it to your congressman, to the editor of the newspaper, share it with your neighbor. It's time yes. to end it. Yes. That's right. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a good night, Dean. Okay. Yeah, um, he's right. It, it, it's time. It's it, You can feel it. Well, one thing that I've been pointing out some lately is that we've got everyone in Washington with their pajamas in an uproar about uh, cutting government spending. Roughly speaking, since 1970, the federal government has spent over a trillion dollars on the war against drugs. Mm -hmm. They're now spending something like 16 to 18 to 20 billion a year on enforcing the federal marijuana laws. So if you're looking yeah. for a place to save money in Washington, before we start trimming the Pentagon too closely, before we start destroying Medicare, uh, maybe we should think about locking the door on the DEA and the ONDCP. Let's take a break, and we'll see you in a few minutes.
with some brilliant entrepreneurs, came up with the idea of blocking the endocannabinoids in our body to create a new diet drug. The theory being, if cannabis gives people the munchies, then blocking the endocannabinoids would make them lose their appetites. The drug they developed, Ramonabont, did indeed reduce appetite by blocking the endocannabinoid receptors. But data from clinical trials showed that Ramonabont users suffered depression, anxiety, insomnia, and aggressive impulses at twice the rate of subjects given a placebo. Well, Sanofi Aventis, the company that had, had developed and was marketing this agent, did not study people with a history of psychiatric illness or depression before they applied for approval. That was probably a mistake. The EMA did approve it, and the drug's been on the market in Europe for a year, a year and a half by now. And I've, I've sort of said, if there was any real problem with this that was more than just theoretical, we would know. Well, it turns out we do know. And they've, they've suggested now that the risk for this agent is, outweighs the benefit. In one study, there were five suicides among Rabonabont users because, as they discovered, endocannabinoids are also mood regulators with the capacity to make us feel euphoric or, when blocked, depressed. Ramonabont was finally withdrawn from the market in 2008. Researchers at the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Texas reported that mice and Ramonabont developed potentially cancerous polyps at a far higher rate than controls, confirming that endocannabinoids are not only mood regulators, but tumor regulators as well. Welcome back to Drugs, Crime, and Politics. Uh, before we go into our last little bit tonight, uh, Clay, I believe you've got a bunch of announcements. Oh, yes. Coming up. Tomorrow night we have the uh, monthly normal meeting. It's going to be at the West Gray Cafe at 7.30, and that's at 415 West Gray. Then you have September the 7th, the Galveston Democratic Party has invited uh, uh, Steve Nolan, uh, Steve Nolan, Nolan down to uh, talk to the, uh, the group about drug policy and Houston Normal, what we're doing. Uh, then we go to September 9th on 290 and 43rd Street. They are having a festival called the Metal Zone, and it's to celebrate the end of the summer with a concert. Um, October 7th at Bohemio's, we have a uh, drug war karaoke that's going to be going on there, and Bohemio's is down on Telephone Road. And we will keep reminding you of these upcoming events as we, okay. every policy. And remember, uh if any of you anywhere around the city or the state uh, have an event coming up that relates to drugs or drug policy or drug law, uh, if you'll email us at uh, the address that shows on the screen, uh, we will try to get an announcement of it on the air. And if you are watching this on streaming video or uh, delayed on uh, YouTube. You can't call us on the phone because we won't be here, but you can email us and we will get to your question or comment uh, at the next show and I will probably give you a direct answer before then. So uh, That's about all the announcements I have for upcoming events. Okay. Uh, one thing, at least uh, at the presidential level. The political season is starting to heat up. Uh, and this means that more and more presidential candidates are going to be appearing at town hall type meetings, are in debate situations, are in public forums of one kind or another. 
Most of them have social media sites up and active now. Uh, don't pass up any opportunities to attend these things and in a polite but forceful way ask these candidates what they're going to do about the archaic, stupid drug laws in this country. And I, I'm not sure that I would be any nicer about the, what I call the laws than that. Uh, hmm. ar archaic and stupid, I think, is being rather polite when it comes to discussing our drug laws. That is. <laughs> <clears throat> and remember, we're, we're now up to 15 states 16. plus the District of Columbia that have medical marijuana laws. That's roughly a third. We have more than a dozen that have decriminalized marijuana. Massachusetts having done so only one election ago. And Massachusetts right now has re referenda working its way toward next year's budget both for medical marijuana and for full legalization of medical mm -hmm. marijuana. So the people across the country are active. We need to get active too. We don't have anything like a referendum system in Texas and frankly I think that's a good thing, but uh, we can put much, much more pressure on our elected representatives in Austin and in Washington than we do. And I think it's time that we need to work a little harder to make sure they know what our desires are when it comes to the drug laws. And right now with the mood that's out there, I think a large part of what we need to be doing is pointing out to them how much money and effort we could be saving if we simply quit spending unneeded millions and millions and billions of dollars on enforcing these really stupid drug laws and throwing people into prison for violating laws that shouldn't be there in the first place. So, in other words, keep those cards and letters rolling in. And I literally mean cards and letters. So, uh, what we hear from elected representatives is that on an issue they may get thousands of emails on a particular issue. But what adds up and what ends up really counting is the smaller stack of letters written on paper and sent through the mails with a stamp and handwritten, if at all legible, is better than typed or printed on those letters. All of them have local offices as well as their Austin or Washington office you can call the local office, set up an appointment for the next time they're in the home district, go down, see them in person, look them face to face across the desk, look them in the eye and say, tell me again why you won't vote to let my grandmother have marijuana to ease her suffering. And I think that that face-to-face -face question will do more good than anything I can say here week after week after week. Mm-hmm. That's That summarizes it up pretty damn well. Okay. Any other burning issues that you want to get off your chest? Oh, the, uh, no, I think I pretty much got them all. Um, I, yeah, I, I just... The big thing with me, this this program, is why these states are trying to change the laws after the people have gone through 
all this power to refer do a referendum, get a, a bill passed, yeah. and then the the state tries to um, go around it with <laughs> different laws. Well, you know, I was I was kind of joking off camera with our guest on the last last show that mm -hmm. wants to be a congressman and jokingly said that I thought our political system should start copying NASCAR. That any time a representative or a congressman appeared in public or in any official function, he ought to have to wear a jacket. And on that jacket, there ought to be the name or the logo of anyone who had given him more than $2,500. And, you know, I think that if that congressman, any time he gave a speech at a Rotary Club and says, I'm here to represent you, was instead wearing a jacket that had the logo of everyone he really is representing, it might make a difference in the way things work out. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Let's start talking that one up. I'd love to see it happen. <laughs> you and me both. Um, you know, I, I see these um, protests over in, uh, not protests, they were just out and out uh, riots in England. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that it's all over power and control. I think that in England, and to some extent in Egypt and other places, as much as anything, it's lack of future. The rioters in these cases are mainly young. They're mainly the coming of age generation. Most of them are way undereducated and know it. They don't have jobs. They have very little possibility of jobs. They have no way to build a life for themselves. And it sounds like... Uh What's happening right here? It sounds a whole lot like what's happening here. And, you know, the last time we had a bunch of youth in this country that were feeling that alienated back in the middle 1960s, we had a few fiery riots in American cities as well. If we don't stop the malaise and start making things happen in this country, we're going to be facing those kinds of problems as well. Let's quit talking economics. Let's forget all about Ayn Rand and her cockamamie ideas. And let's get people working. Let's go to the moon again. Let's build the interstate highway again. Let's get some more jobs out there put money in people's pockets, and let them build the future they want. And we'll see you all again in about two weeks. Thank you, and good night. Good program. We have these private prisons that have now hired lobbyists to go get minimum mandatory than you. Uh, I began to understand that the 17 or the 19 year old kid I had in the backseat of my police car was not a criminal at all. Remove the profit motive. If you remove the profit motive, you can do away with almost all these problems. And how do you do that? Simple, damn prohibition, which can only mean one thing. Legalize drugs. Legalize all drugs. We really want to improve our urban neighborhoods. The most important thing that we could do, the single most important thing that we could do, is end the war on drugs.